Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap up of some of my recent nonfiction reading. I'm going to start with the lightest thing that is the easiest to talk about, and that is Robin Haw's Cook Korean. This is labeled a comic book with recipes, but it's really a cookbook in comics format. Unlike a lot of cuisine manga like Fumi Yoshinaga's What Did You Eat Yesterday? or foodie comics in the French market like Yam Long's To Eat and To Drink, this doesn't really have a story at all. There are a couple of memoir-esque pages at the beginning, and there are a couple of multi-panel pages in which uh, the author explains the history of a particular food item, but it is 95% recipes. So go into this expecting a cookbook, not a book that includes recipes, because despite the subheading, that is what this is. As a recipe book, I thought this was fantastic. I do think the comics format really lends itself to recipes. It's one of my favorite things about foodie or cuisine comics. So I liked seeing a cookbook that is specifically comics formatted. But having said that, it is mislabeled. I did go in expecting this to be a foodie book. Yes, that is a cookbook. It's a good cookbook, especially if you're looking for some basics of Korean cooking. I think that would be a great gift, actually, for people who are in a situation where they're starting to cook for themselves for the first time, whether it's because they've moved out of their parents' house or so they've just gotten divorced and they had a partner who did all the cooking. I think that would be a top-notch gift for that market. And let's talk about nature writing next. I listened to the audio version of Helen MacDonald's Falcon. And in the audio form, it is narrated by the author herself. It is an odd kind of book in that it is just a series of facts about falcons and falconry as a sport and whatnot. So unlike H is for Hawk, which I think half of Booktube talked about, everybody who reads memoirs read that, I feel like, uh, this doesn't really have a story. We're not processing anything. It is genuinely just groupings of chapters in which there is more or less a theme of this is urban falcons, breeding, risks to certain species specifically, and rehabilitation efforts uh, in terms of falconry, the sport, and falconry, the method of hunting. There's a bit about the history in different places in Europe and Central Asia and West Asia. And it's all kind of interesting if you're interested in falcons, but there is not much meat to it. It doesn't have a lot of depth. The audiobook was just over four hours. I think the physical book is quite short. And I think if you are looking for something that will resemble H is for Hawk, that is not what this is. Because that book, which was both a memoir of the author processing her grief after her de the death of her father, a process of training a goshawk, and research into T.H. White, this doesn't have any of those linkages going through it. It's just, here are some facts about falcons. And if you care, then <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, if you don't care, or you're uncomfortable with hunting, yeah maybe not for you. And the reason I picked that up is because prior to that I had listened to the audio version of The Eagle Huntress, the true story of the girl who soared beyond expectations, which is a kind of middle grade memoir, which is credited to Aishalpan Nurgaev, who was the subject of the film The Eagle Huntress, who is a Kazakh Mongolian who competes in falconry competitions and was the, both the youngest and the first female to win one of these competitions specifically in Mongolia. One of the things that the book uh, mentions is that uh, after the movie came out, the movie suggests that she's the she was the first female falconer <laughs> basically ever, which is not true. And anyone who knows falconry knows that's not true and was pointing out, no, right there in Kazakhstan, there are also award-winning female falconers. But in any case, that was the movie. This is her story, and it's clearly aimed at, say, an 8 to 10 year old audience. Now, even though it's credited to Nurgayev herself, uh, there's an American co-writer, Liz Welsh, and I would say that she's probably the true author of this piece, because it, it very much feels like an American inspirational children's story. And that is fine for what it is. I think if you were on a road trip with your kids, you could put this on, and it's kind of a nice inspirational story. Look at this girl. She wanted to become a falconer and she did. She got, you know, got her own eagle and, and whatnot. As an adult listening to it, you do notice bits and pieces where it's like, this is explained in a way that doesn't feel natural. It feels like it was written in the first person by a third party, which I think is the case in all kinds of books that are ghost written or co-written. But specifically for children, it feels almost misleading, but I think I'm just being a little unfair and a little picky. Also, I, I think the, the one other nitpicky objection I would have is I think that any kid whose family 
either hunts for food purposes or farms is not going to be as far removed from this. It, this book clearly assumes that the audience is kind of urban children who have no idea about the idea of actually being in contact with your food before you eat it, which I think is, well, less common than it ideally should be, at least in my opinion, um, is not as uncommon as I think the author, Liz Welsh, I, who again, as I said, I think is really tell the one telling the story, seems to think that it is. But am I being nitpicky? Very possibly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it is what it is. This is a fun thing to listen to on the side. Next up, because I do have a dog again, so I am listening to more audiobooks than I had been for most of this year, I listened to Kurt Vonnegut's A Man Without a Country. This came out in 2005 originally, and it is a series of essays um, mostly poking at American politics and at capitalism and at cultural attitudes towards war and peace and art and everything else in between. In a lot of ways it feels almost like a comedy album because it is clearly written with an eye towards political humor as opposed to political analysis. So uh, I think if you go in, and I mean, I think to a certain extent that's expected. There is some interesting stuff where he talks about how he considers himself more of a political humor writer than a speculative fiction writer as he's often labeled and all of that is interesting. Some of it does feel a bit like old man yells at cloud in bits and some of it is the kind of thing that because this was written 15 years ago, I don't know, American politics has gotten even worse. And I don't know. But yes, it was entertaining. I laughed. But yeah, if you're interested in, if you like Vonnegut's fiction and you're up for some political humor and you feel like his political humor would be in line, yeah, this is reasonably entertaining. <laughs> that sounds negative. I did give this four stars on Goodreads. I don't mean to be negative. It's one of these things that has aged less well in my mind. I really enjoyed this as I was listening to it, but as a couple of weeks have passed, I've, it's kind of floated away. It hasn't had a lot of stickiness for me. Just as a quick data point, I've seen a couple of people refer to this in places as a posthumous collection, but this actually did come out two years before he died. So it is not a posthumous collection in case you read that somewhere. And finally, I said I was gonna do a separate video about political prisoner memoirs, but I don't think I'm going to, so I'll talk about this here. Next up I finished I Will Never See the World Again by Ahmet Haltan. He's a novelist and journalist in Turkey who, after the events of July 2016, uh, was initially arrested on charges of spreading subliminal messages on television, but then the charges changed and then he was released and then he was rearrested and he has been released again. Um, this was written before he was re-released and his initial sentence had been a life sentence and he, so it, hence the title and hence his a kind of bleakness to the way this feels as you read through it. The first section of the book is a fairly straightforward memoir in the sense that he describes his arrest and then his early days in prison before being specifically charged. And all of that is straight, is interesting. Um, he describes a bit like he had a book with him and was reading that and what were his cellmates like. But as we go forward in time, the book, uh, the chapters each go for different ideas and different thoughts and different themes. So there's one that's on birds and what kind of birds are landing somewhere. And is there a guy in the cell next door who has a bird that can't fly and this is his hobby now. He has another one that's a bit where he has cellmates who are all in the military. So he talks about what do these colonels think? The one who is an officer on submarines, he's okay with being <laughs> confined. And you know the other ones who are processing the fact that their colleagues, who many of them had thought were friends, sold them out and interesting bits like that. He has bits about being in his 60s when his cellmates are much younger than he is. He has bits about being non-religious and having cellmates who are quite observant and what that is like. And then there are just bits about how did he predict his own future in one of his novels and how uh, and how that goes. So I enjoyed it more and more as it went on. The first section that is the most straightforward memoir bit uh, was kind of the most generic part of it. But yeah, I, I, stylistically, I enjoyed this a lot. And I think it, unlike reading like Arun Ferreira's The Colors of the Cage, it feels a little lighter just because I know he was re-released, whereas Ferreira I know was re-arrested. Re and so that 
has an extra external layer that you have to think about <laughs> as you're reading it. Um, but yeah, I, I've, the one critique I've seen some people have of this is that because he makes so many literary references to a lot of very highbrow stuff, also to his own work, that so, that strikes some readers as a bit pretentious. I appreciated that, I, I, but I enjoyed it. I thought it added a lot of flavor to it in the way that, uh, especially when he's talking about cellmates being teachers or military people, how they're processing their experiences through a different set of cultural standards. And he's a writer, so literary references are going to be his cultural standards. So uh, I enjoyed that. But as I said, some people some people don't love that element, but uh, I thought it was particularly, but I thought it was good. I thought it was well done. I thought it was absolutely worth reading. But I'm going to break here and go film a separate one for fiction because that's going to be endless. All right, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.